going to continue. That sounds familiar. Yes. And this meeting is being recorded. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Zoom. Yes. <laughs> All right. Hello, Just Animals Podcast. I'm Ellen. With me, as always, is my dad, aka Guy. Peace, love, and happiness. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> Anyways, and back with us again, Jay the Zookeeper. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. It's a little bit rainy out today, but it's been a pretty good one. Oh, we do need rain, so that's yeah. good to hear. And that's actually going to come into play later with our animal today. So today we are going to be discussing the Cape buffalo, the Cape otherwise buffalo. known as the African buffalo. And quick side note, which Jay, you probably knew this, I did not, um, that buffalo and bison are not the same animals, <laughs> even though I know we use the word interchange. Did you know that? It's not the same animal. A buffalo and bison is not the same. Even American. Yes. They're two different animals. Oh, well, let's see. What do you mean, a bison, a bison sheds their. I don't know if the buffalo sheds. The okay. bison sheds. Sheds what? They're like a fur coat. Okay, well, I don't know if shedding has anything to do with that. All right. So, anyways, the African buffalo, not to be confused with water buffalo, which are Asian and they are taller and also domesticated. And are so, are you saying that the Cape buffalo and the African buffalo are synonymous? No, it's the same animal. Same animal. Okay. Stop this. Yes. All right. Yes. I mean, come on. We have the expert right here. And so, really quick, before we get into that, um, scientific name Sincerus Caffer. Did I say that right? Did I did I get that right, Jay? You did. Okay, Sincerus great. Caffer. You're right. So sin comes from the Greek word sun, and charis means horn. And then um, as for their description, I don't want to steal too much of your thunder, Jay. So would you like to describe them? Or I can do my little piece or whatever you want to do. You can do your little piece here. Okay, perfect. All right. So uh, based off my research, they were commonly referred to as cows on steroids. And there's actually only one species of buffalo in Africa. However, there are four distinct subspecies. Now, do <laughs> sorry, ignore that. Now, do you work with any of the subspecies or the four subspecies? Do you know of if what their subspecies are the ones that you work with? I don't know the subspecies I work with specifically. Um, for the most part, in captivity, um, there's going to be mostly just the two standard species, subspecies that you're going to see working with. Mm -hmm. um, and three of them kind of look very similar. Um, gotcha. If you were to put them next to each other, the general person's not going to see the difference. Sure. So the difference is the fourth one. Ah. And that is the, uh, the, Cape or the I'm sorry the forest buffalo. Oh, okay. So they're gonna be a little bit shorter. Their horns don't get as big, and rather than the more typical brownish to blackish coats that you'll see on the Cape buffalo, the forest buffalo are gonna have more of a reddish brown tinge to them to help okay. uh, camouflage more in the jungle. Okay, okay, gotcha. So per Brit Britannica, the Cape such African buffalo is the largest and most formidable of Africa's wild bovids. And these thick, heavy set, they're even toed, I say ungulates, but I've also been corrected and said it was ungulate, um, are dimorphic with males or bulls weighing around 1,100 to 2,000 pounds, 500 to 900 kg, wow. and cows weighing in at a range of 770 to 1,370 pounds or 350 to 620 kg. And at their shoulders, a height, their height ranges from 4.9 to 5.7 feet and length between 5.6 to 11.2 feet, not including their tail. That can add an extra 28 to 43 inches. Do you know the stats on your buffalo, Jay? We do not take much of their weights or sizes on them. Um, we keep them that large open pasture so it we're working on training more on them, but okay. as of right now, we don't have any weights on them. Uh, if we were to dart them or do anything like that, we sort of go off of a general uh, idea weight of what that sure. individual would be. But there's a pretty good vari variation from individual to individual on how big they are too. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And so, what? So it says here, Jay, that uh, you probably know this, that uh, can the Cape Buffalo be domesticated? uh some interesting it says no okay can you wait for that please you're getting ahead go for it okay thank you all right so 
Um, meeting in the middle of their heads and forming a helmet-like structure are their horns, and like the part where they meet in the middle of their head is, are called the bosses. Both males and females have horns, however, the female's horns are more narrow, and it takes females about four years to grow completely developed horns, and males about five years. Also, female horns horns tend to not meet in the middle of their skulls, whereas males' horns do. And like we said, they have black to dark brown fur, and females tend to be a little bit more of a red color, and they can live for about 11 to 29 years in the wild. I gather you probably know the ages of your specific buffalo at your facility. For the most part, I know their ages, and if I don't, I, uh, I can look them up pretty quickly in our system okay. to make sure okay. I know where they're at. But. There's a couple I know down to like the day uh, oh, wow. when their birthdays are. So okay. were your uh, okay. Cape Buffalo born in captivity or were they taken from the well? Uh, all of our individuals were born, born in captivity. Um, I believe most of the ones we currently have were all born at my facility. Oh, that's great. Okay, cool. So speaking of facility and their habitat. They're found in sub-Saharan Africa and gajillion countries like Angola, Benin, Botswana, Burundi, Cameroon, Chad, Congo, Kenya, Kenya, Rwanda. They like swamps and floodplains, grasslands, shrublands, and montane forests, ideally anywhere with dense cover, but they can be found in open woodland. They're highly adaptable as well and can be found at elevations as high as 4,000 meters or 13,200 feet. And then speaking of their adaptability, Britannica goes so far as to ascertain that they are one of the most successful of Africa's wild ruminants as they thrive in virtually all types of grasslands in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then also a consistent water source is crucial for their survival. Jay, what's their pasture look like? And I imagine there's many water hole, watering hole, or how do you do the watering situation for them since that is a crucial part of their needs and habitat? So uh, our herd lives in a hundred acre pasture uh, oh. with uh, several other species. Um, but for the most part, we keep three large water troughs uh, on a sort of a, what's the word, like a float valve system. So okay. as the animals drink from it, it'll auto reach those. Um, but outside of that, we, during summers and springs and a little into the fall, we have a, a large wallow that we've dug down with our tractor uh over near the front of their enclosure where we will fill up with the hose so it creates a large wallow for them to sort of roll around in oh. and most of the animals in there seem to enjoy that do, do uh. they need a salt lick jay uh they do like salt licks we keep about two to three out in the pasture just for everybody to use as they want oh interesting Okay. And then according to Britannica, they will inhabit again, just about anywhere, as long as it's within a 10 mile, 12 mile max range radius of water. And then as for their diet, they're strictly herbivores eating various grasses, sedges, leaves, and other plants. And just like cows, they do regurgitate, what? No, go ahead. They do regurgitate their food and chew cud. And to maintain their large size, they rely more on the quantity of food than quality, meaning they can eat much more coarser and taller grasses than most ruminants. And then one figure I got for how much they eat a day was about 13.4 to 35 pounds. And again, water is very crucial for them for their survival. And they can consume as much as 35 liters or nine gallons of water in a few minutes. And females tend to eat a little bit more than males. So I gather since they have this giant pasture, what are they grazing on versus are they being supplemented with hay and whatnot at your facility? So uh, obviously during summer months out here in uh, northern california we don't have a whole lot of uh, good quality grasses growing out right. there so we right. feed them a little bit more supplemental grasses and our uh, what we call our silo grain which is very similar to like it most cow or horse grains that you get um then essentially they get for example our herd we use it's called a bucket that we fill up um and currently our herd is getting about with the whole with the other species in the past year, about three bales of grass hay and about 14 buckets of silo grain. Wow. Um, and about a third of that is just for the buffaloes for the most part. So they oh. get pretty much a bale of hay and about five buckets of grain every single day. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. They really are packing it away. Good for them. 
So Jay, let's uh, oh, yeah. let's let's talk for a second about zoo talk. What? So as your herd breeds, can you wait for reproduction? If we no, no, we're breed? not talking about reproduction. I'm mm -hmm. talking zoo talk. Just oh, okay. take a pill. Do you um, put out on the uh, Craigslist of uh, the ACA? Uh, hey, we have uh, one too many uh, African buffaloes, and are who's interested and. In do you swap? Do they pay for it? Or I don't even know if you can sell it. I mean, how does that work when you like your herds getting a little too big for your facility? Um, so we work with both AZA and ZAA facilities. Um, and uh, our Cape Buffalo herd right now, I believe, I don't believe it's an AZA herd currently. The genetics aren't there. Uh, but we do swap with some ZAAs and some other safari parks. So um, you can find some of our genetics of our Cape Buffalo at some of our neighboring safari parks and things like that as well. Uh, but we'll make trades and deals the same way that other facilities do. Um, we try not to sell individuals. It's not what we like to do. Um, but when you're dealing with other private facilities, sometimes that's what you do. You sell an animal to them and then later on you buy an animal from them later on. Um, but it's still essentially just a more monetary version of a trade between the two facilities so, at that point. So, Jay, who's determining um, the size of the enclosure versus the amount of animals that habitat that enclosure? Inhabit. In, inhabit? Okay, inhabit that enclosure. Is there a, is there a book um, that, or is it, how does that work? So there kind of is a book on it. Um, it's been a while since I've looked at it personally, but in college we discussed what was called rangeland management, and it allows you to calculate how many individuals or species of individuals um, can be properly grazing on uh, the acreage of land based on the type of plant matter that's on there. Um, and it's all based on the aspect that essentially a single animal unit is based on one cow and its calf. Um, and from there you... So like a Cape Buffalo might be like three animal units or four animal units compared to a standard cow. Uh, and then you would calculate based on that and the acreage. Got it. Okay. All right. So speaking of acreage and whatnot, and we'll get into if they're solitary or pack animals, what do you think? Well, if they live in herds, they're, they're pack. Oh, good for you. We even know what their group is called. Yeah. Or, or they're also known as a gang. Didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so they, they have gang signs like. No, but they do exhibit gang like behavior, which we will get into a little later. I'm sure Jay has probably experienced that and seen that. So they are pack animals or gang animals, if you will. And they're found in medium to large herds, like a few hundred individuals, 30 to 200. And um, they're also described as being very gregarious. They kind of thrive on that interaction and being around each other. Sometimes bachelor herds uh, consisting of males who are unable to compete to mate will exist. And there is a social hierarchy to establish dominance amongst bulls, and they'll spar with each other to do that. And females also have a social hierarchy as well. And as many as 2,000 uh, buffalo have been observed co cohabitating in areas that are abundant enough with food and water resources. And should be noted that this would generally take place during the rainy season in Africa. And then, Jay, how large is your herd? And is there a distinct hierarchy? Like, can you tell the pecking order amongst them? Uh, so there are 16 individuals in our herd right now, um, and there is most definitely a distinct hierarchy. <laughs> um, I can always tell who is in charge and who is not in charge in that herd. Okay. So if something, if a little, you know, scuffle occurs or someone tries to challenge, will the uh, top dog essentially squash that? <laughs> um, I only ever seen one moment of challenging ever in the herd um and he uh, squashed that very quickly and let <laughs> you know that he was the one in charge ah okay so he was like we're not doing this today like nice try but we're, we're you're done you're done <laughs> oh yeah he, he made it very clear very fast <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome all righty and then for behavior which i you know the more i looked into these animals the more fascinating i found them um but while they are non-territorial they are highly aggressive and have also been referred to as ill-tempered fierce and unpredictable 
They are known as being the most aggressive buffalo in the world. And uh, to do with that info, what you will, you hear that? Most aggressive buffalo in the world. Most aggressive. Uh, they really do understand the whole strength and numbers concept as wounded animals seek refuge within the herd and makes them better than, which I think makes them better than most humans because the herd will then also look out for them. And they also look after their blind or disabled herd members. Additionally, when they're lying down, uh, they don't, they not only lay near each other, but they'll lay on top of each other, like resting their heads and on each other and whatnot. And they are active throughout the day and night. They'll be roaming around for as long as 18 hours a day. The majority of this time is obviously spent grazing and chewing their cut. Uh, males move in and out of the herds, generally staying during the, the dry season to form bachelor groups and rejoining the herd during the rainy season. And they love to wallow in pools, as was stated. And especially in the hotter months, they like to roll around and get muddy. And then, Jay, like you already said, you do have a mud hole, but I'm assuming you've probably seen them snuggling together. Are they as, you know, snuggle buddy as they proclaim them to be? <laughs> uh, they, they are incredibly snuggly. So pretty much every single morning when we do life checks, you can figure out wherever the sun is shining the most, uh, more than likely the herd will all be laid out just spread out on the ground, heads on top of each other's backs, just, just enjoying the early morning suns. Oh, that's kind of cute. <laughs> so, so Jay, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, in the wild, are they have, are, are these Cape Buffalo, do they have to be in uh, reserves or do they uh, just roam around wild or how is that, uh, how is that right now in, in Africa? Do you know? Uh, so, um, they're going to roam pretty wild. Um, obviously, if there's reserves present, they're going to stay in reserves as they pass through. But they are similar that they like a large amount. I'm so of sorry, Jay. One second. Hold on. We got uh, somebody deciding to create some noise outside. Okay. If she's closing the door. All right. Quiet on the set. Okay, sorry, continue. No, yeah. So they love, uh, they migrate uh, pretty heavily in Africa as well um, to follow with the wet seasons. Um, so they'll be in reserves, but there's going to be times of the year where they're more in one reserve area than others. Um, but conservationally speaking, they're not really threatened currently, but their population is decreasing like a lot of the large uh, animals and herbivores in Africa are, uh, mostly due to habitat fragmentation and just urbanization. As people keep building out and more agricultural and stuff like that, a lot of the area that they use to migrate through areas gets taken and suddenly the normal paths they would take uh, aren't there anymore. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Is, is um, I'm not sure what climate issues Africa is having, but are they Probably the same suffering are. from a drought that will impact the drought? Drought, drought, yeah, of population of animals. Um, it's been a while since I looked into it, but from what I remember, is there's their droughts are more essentially more severe than they would normally be, and their rain seasons are more severe than they would normally be. So they're um, having this extreme on both ends. Yeah. Which obviously is going to cause a problem for the animals uh, in the end, um, because if there's more extreme dryness, it's going to be farther and farther for these herds to have to travel to get the water sources that they would True. Right, right. True. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And then speaking of sparring, uh, it's initiated when one male approaches another male and presents his horns. They then lock horns and twist from side to side. They go for about seven rounds, lasting 10 seconds each. Seven rounds. Uh, they can kill each other, obviously, if conflict escalates to that point, which eek. Uh, females will tend to choose where the herd will head next for grazing. They pick the spot because when the males leave the herd for grazing, they will just stop as soon as they come upon a good patch of grass, and females and calves will just walk away from them to find another patch. You're nodding. I'm sure you've seen. It sounds like you've probably seen this behavior. An yeah. <laughs> uh, area large enough for everyone that can be accommodating, that can accommodate everyone in the group, and to avoid being easy prey, 
The herd stays close together and will form a large group made up of the core herd surrounded by subordinate males and older animals. And then this type of formation actually helps prevent animals from being singled out and picked off by predators. And then they will charge prides of lions on mass, which we'll kind of get to later. And while known for their cantankerous disposition, um, amongst each other, they engage in mutual grooming, affectionate nuzzling, and playful ear chewing. So it sounds like if you're a Cape Buffalo, you're probably okay. If you're not a Cape Buffalo, probably should just avoid. <laughs> So I have a question here. This is uh, very interesting. I'm on uh, snowafricaadventure.com. Uh, and there's some interesting facts about Cape Buffalo. They have they are even seen or, or doing voting before moving to a particular direction, which is quite unusual in wildlife. Have you ever seen this voting yeah, behavior? Well, he was nodding his head when I was talking about with the females choosing where to go. Yeah. So go over that when you've seen your herd do that. This, this seems like a very common thing. If you let the guys choose, they're going to mess it up. <laughs> yeah. so essentially it's just uh what they'll do is uh, during a rest period they'll see the uh the mothers uh who sort of lead each family group um will pick a side of the herd to rest on and when they pick a certain side the more family groups that pick that direction then that herd will pick up and move going that direction opposed to the other direction oh wow okay. uh, yeah, behaviorally speaking, it's really interesting because they have very strict family groups. Um, uh, so in our enclosure, it's a large hill. And uh, when we put out food, you can see them run down. And you'll see a mother almost always in charge with her oldest behind her, almost directly going back in ages as they go back directly down that family line um, up until their oldest has their own calf and then she will end up having her own little family line that they'll trail down. Um, but it's a very uh, matriarchal family oriented group uh, within their herds. So are there any uh, birds in your facility that uh, develop a relationship with the uh, Cape Buffalo? Like it says here, they, they use it to clean their body. Uh, have you seen birds? You mean oxpecker? I don't know what it's called. Uh, yeah, unfortunately we don't have any oxpecker. It says African Cape buffaloes are have are having a strong relationship with their with migrating birds as they help them clean their body. Birds used to alert the African buffalo before any problem comes towards them. So it's kind of like it's a, like run with the rhinos. Yeah. Anyways, back to that. So yeah, we'll speak, speaking of calves, let's I'll let you take it away with production because these babies seem huge and the gestation period seems quite involved as well. Eleven months. It's just quite new. Yeah. So. Uh, so their gestation is give or take about, uh, we like to say a year is a rough way that we say it. Um, and that's, uh, so we look at it in the regards that our herd for the most part is pretty clockwork. Uh, okay. If I know that one of my females has a baby, uh, for example, August 13th, uh, I know that she's going to have that baby almost exactly eight and a half to nine months later. I'm sorry, nine and a half months later. Uh, because they, so after they give birth, they give off all those wonderful, good smelling pheromones that the boys love. Ah. So he will go immediately right back into her. Uh, he'll exhibit the Fleming's response, which is a sort of a, a lip curl as they find that really good smell of the pheromones. And then uh, he will follow her around and uh, breed her back for next season. Oh. Um, but they work sort of in a harem society. So they'll rotate, at least in our facility, one female, then the next female, then the next female, then the next female for a male. But, but what you'll see is uh, pre-estrus, uh, our secondary male, uh, Woody, will exhibit what's called a, uh, let me double check what it's called a waiting behavior mm -hmm. and what they'll do is he will essentially wait with her and rest his head on her chin back and essentially take care of her until she gets to estrus and then big man oh and our herd will walk over and promptly tell woody he needs to leave and he will take over uh hanging out with the female now uh and it's just sort of the way they go uh he knows that he needs to care for the other females so that Oak can focus on these other females at a different time and sort of moves through the herd and it helps the herd run more smoothly. 
uh, and it's just sort of how Cape Buffalo work. Uh, in captivity, in the wild, they tend to, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, stash their babies. So their babies may take about a week to a week and a half before they're up running with the herd. Um, in captivity, they tend to be up running with the herd pretty quickly, uh, if only because they don't have predators to worry about. So there's not a strong need for them to stash. They do have the strength to get up and move almost the day of. I've seen those babies run in full speed a couple hours after being born. Oh, so they're up ready to go. Like, okay, come on, let's go. You're, you're yeah. born. Like, you don't get a transition period. Just get up. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it feels like within a month, sometimes you start to see those little horned knubs popping yeah. in on the tops of their heads already. Oh, wow. Oh, so they just, they, they like, everything just kind of instantly starts developing. So how much do the babies weigh when they're born? I mean, this is a big animal, so I imagine the baby's not too small. <laughs> uh, so they are pretty much the only animal that I've seen uh, in our past year that we don't do uh, neonatal checks on. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the size of them and obviously the protectiveness of mother and the herd. Right. Yeah, I don't see but, it uh, near her. Yeah. <laughs> I have never been like directly next to a baby Cape Buffalo yet. I've definitely seen them walking by the truck when they're born. Um, and they're still, they are larger than like a cow calf when they're born. So they're large animals. Still. Okay, so like 200 pounds or so. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I wouldn't know it exactly, but they are. That's still pretty They're big. definitely bigger than I always expected. Myself. Right. Oh yeah, well, I think that's a lot of animals too. Like, you know, you see wolves on TV and then like you see a wolf next to a dog and it's like, you know, that's a lot bigger than what I had in my mind. Or you see, you see wolves at the zoo, and it's like, that's a lot bigger than I than what I was thinking a wolf is. So oh, I guess know exactly. Like, just... Every time you knock somebody down, I get close. I have a re-realization of how big the animals I'm working with are. Sometimes. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay. Uh, the, I was going to say that uh, they kill a lot of people. Where the people hunters. Where get to that part. It's what? the human encounter section. Oh, human encounter. Human, wait, I didn't know you that. know the you know the outline. Stop should this. Should we put on some light? Yeah, we should. Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. As for means of communication, most communication is visual. It is in the form of body language, um, i.e., like posturing, lowering of the horns to initiate sparring. Will they like play fight? Or I'm sure will the calves play fight or play spar? Oh, uh, see, now you're talking my favorite thing. Yeah. Uh, so in our, our herd. We have uh, two boys. Um, okay. They are brothers, and they're about a year, year and a half apart, if I remember correctly. Krang is the older one, and Voorhees is the younger one. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, since we're talking about means of communication, it's a really, really fun little anecdote with them and their little family. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Voorhees was born a little after I started. Uh, just side note, he got his name because he was born on Friday the 13th. I was about to say, is it uh, so, team? like, you know, shelters will do yeah, yeah. their names for the month? <laughs> yeah, so just uh, most of our younger buffalo in the herd are all named after, like, villains and movies and TV shows and stuff. Uh, Love it. But so, Krang and Voorhees. Uh, the Simpsons? So right after I started, Voorhees was born. And uh, his mom would take Mapingo. Mapingo would take Voorhees and walk him around. And Krang, this was his first time he'd experienced his mom have a cat. Oh. So he would sit up there at the coma and you would just hear him cry. <laughs> just just these sad, sad <laughs> calls as mom would walk away with the new baby. Oh. Um, but as they sort of uh, grew up together, it was really interesting to watch because Krang became this like, really interesting big brother towards not just like Voorhees but towards all of the little baby buffaloes that would start to come after him um and you'd see Krang as just like this male who is like ready to go play with them and he's always super excited to be around them always wrestling with horns um you can catch a moment where he'll get excited and then you'll just see the babies get the zoomies and just want to go run around with big Krang all day long Adorable. And so it's really interesting to see, like, he just sort of became this, like, interesting uh, big brother to not just Voorhees, but, but the other buffaloes as they develop. Yeah, he went from crying to uh, I've been I've been replaced and resentful to now, oh, you know, actually, this is kind of working out for me. So uh, cows fight? Yeah. 
Cows will do. Yeah, they'll uh they'll wrestle with each other and just rub horns and heads together. Oh wow. Okay. And then yes, speaking back to our lovely ladies, uh, again they'll pick where to uh, graze next. And um, per animalia.com, African buffalo make various vocalizations. They emit low pitched calls to signal the herd to move. Uh, they'll signal to their change direction. Leaders emit a gritty or creaking uh, gate sound. When moving to drinking places, some individuals make long ma sounds and calls up to 20, 20 times a minute. And when being aggressive, they make explosive grunts that may last long or turn into a rumbling growl. Cows produce croaking calls when looking for their calves, and cats make a similar call that wang noise that when threatened by predators, or I guess when they're sad because they are no longer the only sibling. <laughs> and these grunts and honks and croaks. And then um, have you ever seen, will they ever get, you know, when they're kind of maybe had enough of each other or the mom is trying to maybe correct the baby, will she kind of not roar like kind of growl or do a guttural like noise or snort is snorting a thing for them like will they communicate through yes. snorts? okay oh they are incredibly vocal you know, with each other and with us um oh okay and they've had enough of each other or like if we're driving by in the truck and we'll stop and we have to like look try to look everybody over make sure nobody's got any cuts or scratches on them make sure it's sure. doing good um but some of them like uh ivory or trap if they've had enough of you um they will stomp those hooves and they will just puff at you Ooh. and just snort and that's their sign of like hey i'm done i'm done i I'm don't done. want you here anymore right and, like, yeah, they don't do anything but uh it's nice to understand that they're like cool they're communicating with you uh right. so i should respect that right. we're done right now we can always circle back later and take a look right uh, but yeah they'll snort they'll puff they'll go on um i've seen them do it to each other and sort of swing their heads at each other to tell the other one to like knock it off or get out of my way right so in the herd is the are the daughters impregnated by the their dad big dad yeah how would that work i don't know i'm just asking you know how that uh, how they uh they they stay in the same herd i think that's part of joining the herd but bachelors will move to different herds okay it, it, it can happen. It's not um, irregular. Um, it's important to remember that I don't know exactly what the coefficient would be, but the inbreeding coefficient for, for Cape Buffalo would be vastly different than, say, what the inbreeding coefficient of, of humans are. So it, one generation of them breeding together isn't going to create large amounts of issues the same way that, you know, one generation of two humans breeding together is going to create. Ah, okay. So interesting. Is a does a, uh, a vet that takes care of cows look after these uh, Cape buffalo, or is it unique? Yes, for the most part. Um, so essentially, when you go to school, you can work as a uh, vet who works on your basic domestic, like dogs and cats, right. or if, if you could follow the way that goes down large animals, and uh, that's usually horses, cows, or exotic animals for the most part, uh, which are zoo ones. So they're sufficiently close to a cow that a, they're a, a, Well, I know that's why I'm asking you know oh, if they can. Yeah. But sometimes animals have different systems. Yeah, and, but you know about large an, you know about large animal vets. Um. So yeah. So Jason. Yeah, speak, okay. go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I didn't have anything to say. Don't worry. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. And then so that's you know what's great is it seems like. I mean, I don't want to, you know, anthropomorphize, but it seems like there's some sort of relationship with you. And I'm sure that they appreciate the fact that you respect when they're getting stampy or snorting, like, you know, you, you're too close. I'm kind of done with you in my space that you guys respect that and back off. I mean, I'm sure that helps avoid any, you know, Cape Buffalo on human contact. But um, is that is that a normal thing in captivity for them? Or are you guys fortunately just keen enough and care enough to realize and recognize those signs that they're posturing and snorting at you to please go away. <laughs> uh, no, they do really well in captivity. Um, so like I said, we do ours in open pasture, but there's other facilities out there that have them in more traditional zoo settings as well. Um, for example, Denver Zoo has a wonderful Cape Buffalo herd. I've only ever heard, um, I've never actually spoken to a keeper directly, but I've spoken to people who've spoken to keepers and mm -hmm. their herd is target trained and all oh, those wow. wonderful things. So you can literally target them through 
their safety areas and be able to hand them like slices of romaine lettuce and train no them kidding. to target proper spots and just like any other animal. Right. Wow. No kidding. Okay. And then as for the unique characteristics and traits, it's thought that rolling in mud is not only enjoyable for these mammal for these animals, but that it may suffocate insects and prevent insects bites. And then their horns are unique in the sense that they are not like any other buffalo. And like my dad said earlier, they've never been domesticated due to their unpredictable defensive and aggressive behavior. Uh, one source said, and I don't know if you can clarify this or not, Jay, that they're one source said that their eyesight is poor. Then another source said that they have very keen eyesight and can spot a lion from a kilometer away. And um, is that how, how you, based off of your observations, how would you grade their eyesight? <laughs> Man, uh, when we were looking at this outline, there, there's one specific buffalo in our herd that came to mind for me, and her name <laughs> is Ivory. Um, I don't know if she just hears really well or what, but man, she has a thousand foot stare. Like <laughs> it feels like a mile away. She's just kink and just catches you and she just locks eyes with you from a mile away and just knows you're there. Um, I don't know if she ain't actually seen me or what, but it feels like she's locking eyes with me every time. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And that's the thing too, when I was looking, when I was doing my research into these animals, you know, and I, this might just be my perception, but you know, I feel like a lot of people view cows as being kind of lowly and dumb, like, okay, just big, big, stupid animal that eats grass. But again, we'll get into that in just a second here that they're quite smart and intelligent. I mean, to have a social hierarchy and whatnot, and to be, to have vocal communication and body communication, I mean, that's not something stupid. Um, <laughs> it just kind of was, always takes me aback. I'm like, okay, yeah, they're not just these animals that sit around chewing grass all day. And uh, speaking of that, they have a highly, yeah. They have a highly de developed sense of smell, and since they're ruminants, they have four chambered stomachs to aid with the digestion. And allegedly, they have a great memory, which we'll touch on more in just a second. And also, they're great swimmers and will swim to the next grazing area. Um, as for their predators and threats, obviously, like Jay said earlier, biggest predator and threat was habitat loss and fragmentation due to the expansion of agriculture. Um, this what, oh shoot, I messed something up. Sorry. Oh, should be noted that sometimes the buffalo are the aggressors and they will charge a single lion or hyena. Older bulls and high-ranking females will chase and sometimes kill lone predators. Allegedly, some will make a sport of it in the wild. Eek. Uh, also, when they have decided that they want to uh that they want to, sorry, what did I put here? Uh, that they want to chase a predator or get rid of them, they'll use their horns to uh, rip their prey apart and then essentially curb stomp them to ensure it's dead. So it's a gore and then stomp, poke and stomp, as I like to call it. Uh, yeah, and then as for who or what targets them, lions, leopards, spotted hyenas, humans, obviously, crocodiles, and then African wild dogs will prey on the calves and juveniles. And have will they, if, I mean, since you said that they're in an enclosure with other animals, will they ever bum rush the other animals or will they... <laughs> Have you ever seen the uh, poke and stomp situation? Uh, it's individual to individual and then individual to individual of the other species. Some ah. of them get along great with other species, some don't. Um, Woody, he he does wonderful with the other species. He His favorite thing to do if he's not hanging out with the buffalo herd, you can almost always catch him hanging out with like our female water buck or our young male wildebeest. Oh. Uh, you'll just catch this big... Cape buffalo and these two wildebeest just hanging out in some mud just away from the rest of the buffalo and anybody else uh so he's good around everybody else some of them are like i don't want another animal around they need oh. to go stand over there right so the ivory, like ivory like that. i'm sorry sorry could you repeat that good yeah ivory's like that she uh she can get moody when other animals are around her and it's not just her so their horns are part of their skull, is that correct? Uh, not, correct. Yeah, it's not, okay. Yeah. It's not gonna be like a deer antlers that, you know. Right, right they don't shed. Right. Yeah. All right, so fun facts and now human encounters, which this is gonna get, which hang on, this is gonna get kind of wild. Uh, you don't wanna mess with these animals. Uh, They're again, highly aggressive and part of Africa's big five, which are the big five large hunting game in Africa, which, I think we touched on this maybe slightly. We're not supporters of trophy hunting. If you have that kind of money to blow, just donate it. Like, why do you need to go 
shoot at something <laughs> and that and they usually will walk you right up to the animal too so it's kind of like you're not even really hunting but that's just our personal take on that but um in uganda they are known as the black death and widow maker black and death. then so since they are so aggressive and granted obviously the captive setting is different from the wild um would you still describe them as unpredictable i mean granted they're still wild animals but you know i'm sure that they have a routine with you guys would you how do, how do you feel about them when you're with them? So it's very interesting. Uh, when I started, I definitely had um, a perception of them before I worked with them. Sure. Um, and it's the easiest thing I can say is out of all of the large herbivores that I worked with in that past year, they are probably the most predictable and the really? most... Uh, they they let you know how they're feeling and communicate with you pretty well about when they're done and not tolerating it. Um, they're really good about if they want to come to an area, I can bang on a bucket or yell out at them and they will stop and they'll wait till oh, I clear out yeah. of the area if need be. But at the same time, if they don't want to clear out of that area, they make it very clear that I'm not going to stop right now. Um, right. You need, you need this to wait. Is your warning. Right. Oh. And then I'll be like, okay, back right. to the truck, everybody. We're not, we're not, doing maybe it. we're not dropping food at this spot today. Like, right. we'll come back in a minute. Like, <laughs> no, we'll we'll back communicate we'll with you. Back. <laughs> Have you ever seen him run? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, 35 miles. It was a uh, pretty, it was a, uh, we had an incident with a buffalo, and uh, so we were trying to keep uh, our two males separated at a moment. And, Ooh. Uh, the herd did not like what we were doing and I have never seen them move like that before in my life. Um, <laughs> I still think about it and the way the herd sort of came down over the hill, it felt like it would fit per perfectly with that, uh, what is it, the the run of the Valkyrie song. Yeah, I was going to say, I was just thinking uh, of Wagner's, yeah, Valkyrie yeah, song. It, da, 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 you know. it felt like it would be fit perfectly with them the way they all just took off running together. They moved like as a single little organism of a herd as they ran. It was really impressive. Was the ground rumbling? Uh, it might have been. <laughs> it was pretty, uh, I was in the back of the truck while they were doing it, so. Yeah, oh, I would have been like, okay, yeah, it's like Jurassic Park or something, back on the truck! Like, you know, the T-Rex is coming. Uh, yeah, so that's so interesting that, you know, and again, it's probably because you guys are respectful of their of their boundaries. Like, okay, he's banging the bucket. He's standing over there banging the bucket. Like, stop banging the bucket. We're not doing this. Mm. <laughs> That's hysterical. And then um, most yeah. people have probably seen, I'm sure you've seen it, that showdown between the buffalo and the lion in Kruger Park. And um, it is these buffalo that get the lion to back down. And they are, again, Africa's only cow-like animal. And there's a game yeah. reserve. I'm going to butcher the name so I'm not going to say it that um they were actually almost entirely wiped out in the 1890s with the rinder pest virus struck South Africa um which you know shout out to all those colonizers it was their fault the Italians actually the virus was introduced by Italian cattle that were brought in by Italian soldiers for their fight against Somalia and the virus was so prolific it killed 5.2 million cattle south of the Zambezi River additionally wiped out a third of the Ethiopian population and two-thirds of the Maasai people in Tanzania Thankfully, this virus was ultimately eradicated in Africa. Do you have to worry about cattleborne illness and disease with your herd? Uh, we do um, in the same way that you would have to with any large ungulate. Um, okay. Some of our animals uh, are more susceptible to these issues than others. Um, okay. So we do, uh, some of them get vaccinated, uh, okay. yearly vaccinations, others uh, will receive We'll do uh, random fecal testings and checks on individuals and herds and collect them. And if we do catch any parasites in that, that means we might start that herd or that individual on a specific dewormer or other sure. anti-parasite sure. to okay. help. Okay. Um, but we don't, yeah, not specifically. Okay. Yeah, so if you get a new animal, is there a quarantine period to check them for any of those you know, illnesses or viruses that are, can you know, just wreak havoc on herds? But yeah, um, so anytime we move an animal, not just from like, um, from another facility to ours or even leaving our facility, we'll usually put them in a holding area for about a week. And when we, they get there, we'll usually put them in a holding area for 
about a week or two as well to monitor yeah. them and then have to reset them out. But even when we just move them from like some of our large pastures from another large pasture, we might put them in a holding area for a couple of days just to okay. see how they're doing and monitor their health directly before we move them to the rest of the area. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And then there was a, there's some old folklore about uh, with their smooth tongues that they can lick the skin off of a person, which is not true. Just fun fact, if you're, if you're, an Af- if you're that close, they're not licking you. Well, yeah, they're probably, they probably killed you at that point. And then per uh, Africa wildlife report, Cape buffaloes are believed to be responsible for around 200 human deaths per year. The primary victims are big game hunters, which honestly go Buffalo. I, my mom and team Buffalo for that one. Um, who are caught by angry Cape Buffalo that has managed to sneak up on the unsuspecting hunter by hiding in dense vegetation or tall grass. They charge thousands of people a year. Uh, This has been reported on numerous occasions of them actually stalking hunting parties, again, hiding and waiting and then ambushing their attackers. Uh, A wounded Cape Buffalo will often try to get behind the hunter, again, and sneak up on them and sneak up on him or her before charging to get revenge. Unlike elephants, Cape buffaloes do not mock charge. And once they uh, have started charging, that's it. They're, they're coming at you. You're not stopping that freight train. You flipped the switch. You know, like I think horse, I think a couple, I'm sure you've seen it too, like the fake charge, the kind of like get away. I mean, this is like, oh, yeah. Charge. Yeah, they're not doing that. So if it's running at you, it's running at you. All right. <laughs> um, and the then toothpaste is out of the tube, it's no returning it. Right, exactly. Uh, they're not only extremely dangerous towards humans, uh, they're also believed to, res- to be responsible for more lion deaths than any other animal. So it's kind of like a weird play is also the predator situation with these guys. And then um, there's a video, which I'm going to post the link to in the episode description, where a croc has grabbed one by the face and the water buffalo pulls it out of the mud hole. And then the other Cape buffalo, no, sorry, not water buffalo, the Cape buffalo pulls it out, dragging it by its face. And no, well, then the other Cape Buffalo come to its rescue kind of, and they start lowering their horns. And then the croc is like, actually, you know what? I'm okay. Right. He literally let go and you see him just like waddle back into the mall. Like I'm not doing this today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, I'll have to show you that video. It's pretty hysterical. It's because you think like, okay, that it has it by the face. Like that's a done deal. I, sorry, Buffalo. But no, no, no. The other Buffalo came to his rescue. Yeah. And then to no surprise, they're hunted by trophy hunters. Tanzania 2004, Canadian outfitter, whatever that means. Uh, Bob Fantana was out hunting in the African bush and was ambushed by Cape Buffalo, subsequently being trampled and gored to death by the animal. We'll have the link to that story below. Larry Trotter out of- One notch on the Cape Buffalo's horn. Right, exactly, right, yeah. Larry Trotter, um, who almost died, was out on an archery hunting trip and at last minute was goaded into including the Cape Buffalo, which was a mistake, seeing as how he almost died. He's right out of Colorado. Uh, a 2015 article, so four years ago, there, 2011, a woman named Angie and her husband uh, described their almost fatal encounter. It first bulldozed her husband and knocked him out cold, then gored her, Ouch. not only leaving her with a gaping wound, but also Ouch. dislocating her spine, oh. breaking ribs, and collapsing a lung. Also, a ton of blood since she had this huge gaping wound. And for whatever reason, the buffalo decided to move on. They weren't sure if it was maybe hurt. They were trying to actually be careful and be in an area that buffalo typically aren't. I think they might have just snuck up on him or whatever. Anyway, she had to be medevac to a facility Jeez. in uh, Victoria Falls, to where they decided to lifelight her to a trauma hospital in Joburg, where she was evaluated by trauma and neurosurgeons. And um, another little fun fact, also graphic warning. People get too close to these Quiet wild you. animals. It's, uh, her wound is so big that one of the doctors could fit his wrist and forearm through it. Lovely. He could see her bowels and the bottom of her lungs. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. So Angie. Well, I feel bad for them because I don't think they were. No, they, no. See that this one is the one where it's kind of like eat. They were on a safari. And again, they were trying to do everything right. And it just, yeah. someone just missed something. I need to be in one of those tiger, uh, no shark cages if you go see them. But, but. Uh, <laughs> Angie is still alive. So is her husband. Um, She is paralyzed though from oh, the accident. God. But um, again, I'll link the story to her uh to in in the episode description and then a female actually had the largest set of horns on record measuring 64 inches so five foot four inches could you imagine that wow so four yeah that's huge so the poke and stomp i mean do they will they kick will they kick animals too i mean i know they stomp they curb stomp but will they kick you i think i've seen them buck like a buck you mean no no no, no, no. like you know like you'll see Um, with the leg out or it's back leg like it's more of the back legs they can't kick the front no not really their legs are uh kind of a uh, stumpy compared to their body size yeah. uh they don't really have the ability to really throw any kicks um okay. they're definitely all horns and head they're 
even if they find something on the ground and they want to figure out what it is, they'll use sort of the top of their head and their nose to sort of rub it to figure out what it is, um, uh, just sort of as like an extra hand almost. Oh, okay. Yeah. So will they use, so it sounds like their horns serve many purposes. They'll use it to assist them with the, uh, will they knock shrubs over? Will they use their horns to like pull shrubbery out or? Uh, I've never seen them do that, but I wouldn't be surprised that they will, uh, you, if you drove through our pasture, you'd be able to see areas on our oak trees that are just rubbed bare of bark and everything from where you'll just catch them rubbing themselves on it, their horns and their it's backs and their sides. Uh, their yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So at your facility, is it, uh, no human is allowed to go in that enclosure, is that right? No, he just said they drive by in a truck. Uh, I know, but he's drive by. It doesn't mean they're in there. I don't know oh, if they, okay, he said well. they were in there. So are you in? Touch them. So uh, I have touched one, and that is uh, during a procedure when we had it darted in, in the tractor. Uh, oh, yeah, and okay. So getting it down the hill. A sleeping uh, one. That's the only time I've ever touched one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we essentially, um, we're on foot in their enclosure, um, but we're not near them. We do our best to give them a lot of space if we're on foot. Um, because we'll have to go in there. We obviously feed them. So we're out on foot during that point. And we have to fix the water things or their bomas. We'll have maintenance workers or construction guys as they build new parts of the enclosure. They'll be out there on foot doing their work out there and then loading back in the truck and leaving with all their stuff at the end of the day. But the buffalo are pretty good about knowing that if somebody's doing something, we'll leave them be. Because as soon as they leave, I can just go mess up whatever they're doing then. Right. Uh, which they will almost right. always do. <laughs> Yeah, so how often are you replacing fences because of that? Uh, not as often as you think. They could destroy that fence if they wanted to at any moment. Uh, they keep that fence up because they want to. Uh, okay. Ew, that's fair. They're, they're big enough to destroy that if they feel like it. But for the most part, we don't really have to repair them too often. We do fence line checks uh, once a month. So we try to check each fence line once a month to make sure, sure that there isn't any damage occurring. Um, obviously wet season or rainy season makes it a little more difficult, Sure, but we try to. So if um, one, we've only had a couple of things. If one were having a health issue, how would you separate that from the herd? Probably dart it. No, but then, then the other ones hang uh, around. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So it's very careful. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a game. So typically like the last time we did a procedure on one, uh, just, we weren't even really doing anything. We were just knocking her down so we could transfer her to another facility. It was a game of about three trucks and two tractors to make sure that we, once we had her darted down, we pushed the herd off and then we circled them up with vehicles, got yeah. her face and eyes covered, loaded her in the tractor, and we were good to go. So were they, were they, I'm sure they were probably talking to you guys because you were kind of, you know, yeah, like right. their instinct is to go help. Right. So when they weren't able to help, were they getting fussy and stompy? I mean, they could ram that truck with their horn sure, for sure. Right? Oh, they definitely could. Um, Luckily uh, for us that day, uh, the for some reason, I don't know why, um, when we darted her, the dominant male in the herd thought it was the secondary male fault. Oh. So he rushed him, which caused him to panic and take off running, which caused the herd to be like, what did he do? And right. take off after him as well. <laughs> so they sort of just took off and cleared out the area for us and didn't even bother us that day. Uh, oh, so I didn't have to deal with them coming back. Uh, but I've heard it's not too hard. You just uh, one a couple of our buffalo in the herd. I've been told really hate weird movements. Oh. Um, uh, one of the keepers figured that out by standing on the back of the truck and kind of moving like a uh, wacky, wavy, inflatable oh. arm guy. Oh. Oh. And it uh, apparently. That buffalo went up on its back legs and turned around and took off in the other direction when they did that. And so, a uh, great way to get buffalo away from you. Oh, okay. Wacky wavy inflatable tube man. Okay. Who would have thought? Go. There's the, if you're in the Africa bush, bring one of those with you. All right. It'll scare the buffalo away. Exactly. Jay, thank you. Yes. Oh, really quick, their conservation status, and then we will let you go here. Thank you so much, Jay. Yeah. Uh, so, like I said, they're uh, not really threatened right now. There's not a huge problem with it but they are decreasing in population right now due to the habitat fragmentation and urbanization okay. and agricultural issues occurring there uh, but they're not of huge concern currently 
Okay. So, well, that's good to hear. Well, that's good. But, you know, as you focus on some of the other large herbivores there that you save, like the rhinos, giraffes, and elephants, you save the land that obviously right. saves the buffalo as well. So, in turn, right. you protect them long term. Point that out yourself. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jamie. Look forward to having you back. If you guys have any questions for Jay or about the Cape Buffalo, shoot us an email, justanimalspod at gmail.com. Find us on Instagram. Please, if you, whatever platform you listen to this, please write a review and give us a five-star rating if you feel so inclined. And as always, we will catch you guys next week. Jay, if you have a, a butterfly person you know, uh, we'd like to get hooked up with them. Yeah, 